Um, Scott, this is a you know million billion dollar question. How do you feel about current market conditions and how Hedera is performing? Yeah, great. I'm, I'm going to turn it into a multi-trillion dollar question um, <laughs> by pivoting perhaps away from you know um, you know the simple question around sort of cryptocurrency pricing generally across the market and. Uh, I mean, I think if I look, explore our own journey and the journey I see, you know, lots of other, uh, you know, particularly corporates and enterprises that we're working with, um, the, the, the journey around DLT adoption is really, is really just getting going. And what we've seen is many, many different ways of measuring, you know, success. Um, and again, like, I, I guess to Brett's similar question, there are different ways of taking these questions and different ways of measuring it. And, you know, for an industry that's not that old, I've already seen acronyms come and go. Uh, in terms of their relative importance and how one measures, uh, you know, the value of or, or importance or success, indeed, of of, of a network. So, from a, from a Hedera perspective, um, you know, what I'm seeing is uh, increased uh, adoption of what I would call, you know, mission critical, um, high value use cases. Uh, they they are typically uh, slower to incubate. They're slower to test. They're slower to adopt. Um, but if you want to change, you know, the world, there, there tends to be a, a lead time in, in doing that. And that, that's kind of the journey we've been on. Uh, what, what, you know, what, we, what we're seeing with you know, Hedera is the adoption of uh, the Hedera protocol based on some of the fundamental sort of technology attributes of that protocol. And so that steady growth in the number of uh, interesting uh, and, and mission critical applications is, is definitely, in, definitely happening. Um, not to be outdone with the industry loving an acronym, I, I've been creating my own. Um, and it's called TVR. And we've heard others, we, you know, Brett was just talking about TPS. We've seen a lot of talk about TBL in the context of DeFi and locked, locked crypto and locked assets on, on protocols. To me, I think what, we, what, what we're going to see is when it comes to large scale, high value um, assets, mission critical projects running on a particular protocol, the question is, which one do they, which one do they trust? And so TBR, total value represented, the total value of things, assets, um, you know, whether they're real world or investment products or whatever they might be, when, when, when people start to trust, you know, substantial portions of the world's GDP to a particular blockchain, which one are they going to use? And so I think TVR, the total value represented, is going to be an important one. And it's obviously something, and I'll come on to it, uh, one of the later questions. Uh, it's something that we've been working towards around the Toco project as well with, you know, putting high value things on, on, on a protocol. So that, that's, for me, a, a very positive message, and notwithstanding current market conditions, that I'm seeing an awful lot of, you know, positive adoption for, for the Hedera protocol. All right. So now I see why you got into the trillions quite quickly. Yeah. Um, Lehman, uh, a lot of folks in the community are waiting for community nodes. Um, do you expect to publish a Docker or something similar um, around the implementation of those? Oh, yeah, we have. So this is, this is great. So I'm also very much looking forward to community nodes. But even before we have the community nodes, you can now download a Docker that has everything you need and you just run it. Um, this is, we've had this for a while now. So our actual mainnet runs, it's all Dockerized, which makes it easy for us to deploy to all, you know, the council members need to be able to do it easily. So we've already Dockerized everything. Even our updates are really cool. The way it goes out is that a transaction goes out, the computers automatically download various things from the internet, recompile things, and then build a Docker image. And then on the date when we're supposed to do the update, each computer automatically switches to that new Docker image that that computer itself had built. Very cool stuff for automating. Uh, but what you can play with right now is a single system where a Docker image, just with two command line commands, you can install it and then you can run it. And it has a mainnet node. So you are creating your own network, your own Hedera network, Hashgraph network with one node, which is your computer. And then it also has a mirror node and the two are talking to each other. And so you can do queries on your own one node network you just created. And then it also has hash scan IO, the equivalent. So it has this um, nice scanner program, a web interface that lets you see all the transactions and what's going on on this little fake network you've created. And then it even has hash IO. So you can do these integrations with other tools that send um, various transactions in that way. So the entire ecosystem is all inside of one Docker and you launch it with one command line, one sentence in the command line. And I've put into chat where you can go get that. It's been on GitHub. It's under the Hashgraph organization, uh, like lots of our fun stuff is. And it's called Hedera local node, hedera-local.node. And so this is cool. 
So our, our goal from the very beginning has been to make it very easy for people to stand up a new node. You just you know, type in one or two lines and you can stand up a new node and to make it very easy to upgrade where the node downloads its own new information. It builds a new Docker image from, from scratch and it, um, it, uh, it just works. So um, play with it. Let us know how you like it. Let us know anything we can do to make it improve. But uh, I, I love that the community can play with this and you know, build your own networks and play with them. And of course, the reason you'd want to do it mainly is if you're building software that needs to talk to our network, you can put a network running on your laptop and just have your software that you're developing talk to the network on your laptop and you have complete control of the network. That's one of the best use cases for it. But it's also just fun to play with. So both. All right. Well, we're looking forward to some good community feedback on that. Thank you, Lehman. Um, Brett, this next one is for you. Can you talk about the importance of ESG? And for those not familiar with the acronym, ESG stands for Environmental, Social, and Governance um, to the Hedera ecosystem. And perhaps um, share some examples of some ESG projects on Hedera and uh, differentiators that are pulling projects to build on Hedera if they are ESG focused. Sure. Let me, um, if I forget any component of that question, please remind me. Um, so uh, right up front, I'd say, you know, from my perspective, you know, people, I'm going to assume some level of familiarity with what we've published and written about. So um, you've probably seen a fair number of, you know, podcasts and blog posts and case studies around the ESG space. But just to remind, remind you, here are some projects. Uh, we have our Guardian open source project, which we are uh, committing a fair amount of resources building out. So what that does is really provides standards based, you know, using uh, verifiable credentials and uh, decentralized identifier standards. So it's, and as well as the um, token taxonomy framework standards that we were a part of uh, leading. So it's standards based um, application kind of glue code, if you will, uh, functionality on top of the Hedera network for end-to-end -end life cycle track and trace of your carbon credits, your renewable energy cre credits. So that functionality is a differentiator um, for sure, um, being so tightly tied to Hedera. Another um, project that we have, uh, well, we have a number of companies that are contributing to that project. Um, so uh, we've got um, Envision and Miko uh, contributing to that project. And most of our um, kind of ESG case studies are in some way taking advantage of the Guardian capability. But before, even before someone discovers the Guardian capabilities of Hedera, they're, they're being attracted to us because of you know, reports like the UCL report published by the IEEE um, that identifies us as kind of the greenest or most sustainable in terms of low energy you know, per transaction. And they came up with a great energy per transaction model is the first time an academic study was done that did that level of analysis. And so that is, a, is an attraction as well, because we've got this carbon, you know, neutral to negative uh, network that people, you know, would love to build their ESG solution on. Um, as, and of course, all the other reasons anyone else wants to build on Hedera, you know, it's less expensive, fair ordering, um, high speed and, and bandwidth. So, the, we, and we've got people building on Hedera like Dovu with the marketplaces, uh, Cripsy, uh, building a platform for people to build their own solutions in the space. Miko contributing kind of the UI around the Guardian and giving a visual you know, visualization to those that are doing track and trace for their, their tokens and their credits. Um, Civic Ledger is doing great work around uh, life cycle management of the tokenization of water rights and water consumption. So essentially you can see the pattern playing out. It's tokenization of fill in the blank and then a track and trace functionality full life cycle, auditable, uh, extremely affordable, um, and immutable. So that's what's attracting, you know, and so that's kind of a reminder of what we've already been doing. Uh, some things that people might not know that I want to get into. So we're global innovator members of the World Economic Forum. And if you're familiar at all with the World Economic Forum and their kind of their role in the global economy, uh, they really are leading ESG. In a lot of ways, they are at the tip of the spear for ESG. So the partnership we have there and the relationships that we've developed there, I think are going to be important for Hedera overall in this space. And then looking inward at the council, um, the corporate utilization committee, which is really focused on use cases. There are other use cases we talk about, 
but ESG on DLT is the primary use case that people want to talk about. It's the one use case that everyone on that council can see themselves participating in. Um, and it, it really is the kind of the first one that's getting a lot of cross council collaboration. Um, and, you know, Toco is one of the companies leading in this space, uh, working with other council members like ServiceNow. Um, Avery Dennison is another leader in this space, building these capabilities for people to, you know, track their carbon footprint and then do something about it. Tokenize offsets and, and report that, be compliant with that. And I could go on and on. We, we could do a whole hour just on ESG, but I can't, I don't think I can overstate the importance of ESG um, with Hedera. We really think it's one of the uh, killer apps of a public ledger, and we're very well positioned uh, to be the preferred platform for that app. Thanks, Brett. And I think it is incredible to see, you know, everyone from startups who have really, you know, focused on a key area to um, council members who are thinking about this across their business. As you mentioned, um, we have a number of Gossip About Gossip podcasts on this topic. Um, so if you're not tired of me after the top of the hour, I would encourage you to go watch some of those because those projects are doing amazing things. Um, Scott, uh, for you, um, I think this is interesting. Um, you know, you've the community has heard Manson Lehman talk about the need for Hedera to be interoperable with other chains. Um, Hedera is an, a general purpose network. So from your perspective, you know, as someone who has been building on the network, why is interoperability important when other chains may, you know, be slower or less secure or um, not offer some of the same benefits as Hedera? Yeah, it's a good it's a good question, and I'll, I'll maybe take it from slight, two slightly different perspectives. Um, go, going back to the non non DLT world for a, for a moment, you know that we don't we don't see um, many or indeed any industries or, or technologies where there is one player. You know there isn't there doesn't tend to be uh, one dominant player. There's not one cloud service provider, for example, for the for the planet today. So there there is just a reality of um, an, an expectation. And in fact, I think if we did, we'd probably end up with a less rich, less competitive, less, you know, exciting uh, environment in which innovation can happen. So there, I think there is, you know, a reality um, that, that we're all gonna, always going to end up with, you know, several, you know, networks, probably not, maybe not as many as there are today, perhaps, but certainly, certainly a, a number of. So that, that reality has to be taken into account with, you know, if, if that is the case, um, there is a need for being able to interoperate with and, and to deal with assets that may move from one from one protocol to the next. And that that then from the other perspective in terms of what we're doing with Toco has been very important. You know, if you're wanting to take a, a digital, you know, virtual asset, a representation of, say, a, a piece of real estate, for example, uh, where does, what's the journey that thing wants to go on? Where does it need to go? What exchanges might it need to end up on? Um, and if those exchanges require or, or haven't currently integrated or are currently using you know, a, a, another chain, there is, there is a need to consider portability of asset cross-chain and interoperability, for, for example. So it is, it is really important. I think the other thing to note is you know, when it comes to technology adoption, particularly in the large sort of corporate environment, um, there is always going to be a question on the procurement sheet. You know, are we going to fi find ourselves here with a technology lock-in situation where if we, if we build here, we can never, never move and we can never communicate with? All of us as consumers find the, the frustrations of that when we're, when we're stuck on maybe one particular mobile phone device that won't talk to one from another web network, for example. So I think there are parallels in other, in other technologies. So I, I, I'd categorise it as being uh, something where you know, give give people the you know the ability to 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 move across and to interoperate with. So give them that functionality, um, but then by in providing the the best protocol, it gives them uh, limited limited need to want to do so unless where where it's necessary. So it's that kind of treat treat them uh, treat them well enough to allow them to leave um, or to move across networks, but also treat them so well that they generally don't want to. Thank you, um, Lehman. Is there a minimum amount of HBAR that will be needed for staking? <laughs> sure, zero. Um, <laughs> no, the staking system is really <clears throat> easy. There is no minimum for how much you need to stake. There is no slashing and bonding or bonding and slashing. There is no lockup. There are no ways you lose your HBARs. There's no ways they freeze up. You don't even have to do anything when you've staked your account and then some more HBARs come into your account. They're just automatically staked as they come into your account. And then if you want to spend them, you can spend them. 
And then they're just automatically less being staked after your account balance goes down. Uh, and so all you need to do is just set up your account to be staking, and then it stakes as HBARs come in. So yeah, the minimum is zero. Don't get a whole lot of rewards with zero, but the minimum is zero. Um, this, of course, is all in HIP 406. Look at that if you want details. It's not, uh, it's not turned on yet, but uh, there was great community involvement in discussing 406, and it got approved, and uh, we're looking forward to it. Fantastic. All right, Rec Brett, next one is for you. Um, if the regulat regulatory authorities in the U.S. continue to, um, you know, to dither or outright turn against uh, distributed ledgers, would Hedera consider incorporating in a more progressive jurisdiction? Um, if not, why not? So um, it is a great question. And it's uh, whoever our stakeholder is who came up with this question, they're not the first to ask this question. So I'll point out that um, this question has been raised by council members, and it is something that we have an eye on. Now, I'd, I'd, make, I'd point something else out. If you look at our council members, yes, Hedera Hashgraph LLC is a Delaware LLC. But the majority of council members, right? You'll see it on most of our website web pages. You'll see us say, you know, owned and operated by the council members. So that's Hedera. Hedera is owned and operated by the council members. The vast majority of those are not headquartered in the United States. So I don't, I can actually answer the second question even more clearly, like if not, why not? I don't know why our council uh, would have any sort of um, existential commitment to operating uh, legally in the United States. Um, I think that uh, they're going to be looking at where is the best place to operate the network or components of the ecosystem um, and take it, take it from there. Um, but what I will also say is that is not our approach, right? We are not looking for the exit. Um, in quite the contrary, we are deeply engaging with US regulators and policymakers and the uh, administration are to try to help um, the US government. You know, they are all trying to figure out how to best regulate this industry. And from the conversations I have, I feel that they uh, in general are um, trying to support this industry. I know a lot of the headlines don't read that way, and I'm not speaking for everyone in DC who's grabbing those headlines, but in general, the people really doing the work, like the staffers that are writing the bills, um, they're trying to make this work for the industry while protecting consumers. So I think the best thing we can do is engage, be a source of uh, valid, actionable uh, metrics and data uh, to, so that they make the most informed decisions. And if that happens, well, then you know, we don't have to worry too much about uh, where we happen to be incorporated. All right, thank you, Brett. Um, Scott, can you share with us the status of, um, can you give us some updates on TOCO and when might we see tokenized assets on the network? Sure, uh, and if Brett thought he could do a long session on ESG, I could go for days on this topic. <laughs> try, and, try and pick up highlights. Um, look, it's a, really, it's a really exciting time. The journey we've been on for what is now, you know, in excess of three years, um, we, we're the, the sort of point in the in the market cycle, in the evolution and the future of finance that we've been aiming at for those sort of three, even maybe four years, um, the world's now turning in front of us. So it's uh, it's a very exciting time in terms of what's what's happening around people looking to digitize, tokenize um, a, a wide range of assets across a, a wide range of geographies. Um, I, I, you know, there's a particular comment there about when will we see things tokenized? We are we are already tokenizing assets. Um, some, sometimes they are confidential um, and, and, and you don't necessarily see or hear about them, but one that we did put out a press release about that I'll just touch on because I think it's, it's an exciting kind of glimpse of the vision of the sort of future of finance piece. Uh, we worked on a, a debt financing project for a, a mining operation um, and did a, did a tokenized debt, debt finance, so effectively representing that, that loan and the interest payments associated with that using, uh, using a HDS uh, token. Um, with additional HDS tokens being paid as the interest on, on, that, on that loan. Now, one of the things that was interesting uh, around that deal was it was actually a US-based owner or asset owner 
uh, the asset owner itself, uh, the asset itself was in was in Eastern Europe. It was a, a calcium mining operation in Croatia. Uh, we used a Hong Kong private company to do the debt issuance and the investors were globally based. Now, if you look at traditional uh, capital raising type activities, they don't tend to look like that. Um, but what the technology is beginning to enable is the ability to do that. Then what we what was then interesting, those tokens were minted and issued into a regulated virtual asset um, uh, accounts with one of our with one of our custodian partners that we work very closely with that's integrated into TOCO. And we saw very rapidly, we saw secondary market trading happening on, on a digital sort of uh, OTC over the counter basis. Now, that's starting to look very much, it, it's one deal um, and it's, um, um, it, it hasn't got all the moving pieces that we'll, we'll, we'll certainly see in the end, but it was indeed an end-to-end -end token issuance, secondary market trading environment in, on a HTS token for a financial instrument linked to a real world asset. So it was, a, it was, a, it was, one, it was one I can talk about um, because uh, we got the approvals from everyone to do so. Um, but it's an example of the sorts of things we're working on. Now, if I look at uh, the pipeline of what we are, what we are working on uh, across a, a range of assets and geographies, it, it is really exciting in terms of uh, what I think we'll be announcing over the next kind of six months um, in terms of deals that'll be that'll be completed. And the the regulatory frameworks, that, just touching on the sort of previous question as well around sort of regulation is it pro is it is it is it negative and we're seeing a lot of ebb and flow around the world uh, around uh, around around some of those those issues but i think the general trend is to become more more supportive you know regulation is good i'm, I'm a i'm a recently recovered lawyer um you know regulation is good for the industry um people don't necessarily perceive it that way but regulation provides protections it provides um certainty for people to actually do things and we're seeing a we're seeing a rise in regulation which i think will also support more people getting comfortable moving into this market all right amazing scott and i agree i think there's probably at least an hour of uh things for us to talk about there yeah. lehman is there a way to build a public or private network on hedera that would port ransomware attacks and if so, do you know of any companies currently doing this? Not really. I mean, <clears throat> you couldn't really do that. So ransomware attacks, you could talk about trying to attack it two different ways. First of all, people hack into our networks. People hack into our offices and get into our computers and lock up your data and then hold it for ransom. The, the real solution is we need better computer security to stop that. And the whole industry acknowledges that computer security today is terrible. There are problems with how we use passwords for everything. There are problems with zero day bugs in the code itself. I think that the solution is to go to more sophisticated ways of doing authentication. It actually involves ledgers and things. So Hedera can help with that. And for the code having bugs, really I think formal methods where you have computerized, computer checkable proofs that your code is correct has gotta be the way forward. I think decades from now, all software will do it. We're just very slowly starting to do it. Hedera is trying to lead the way in our own software for that, but we're far from that. Then you could say on the other side, what about the ransom? Um, you know, cryptocurrencies are untraceable. I think most ransoms are done with Bitcoin today. Um, it's untraceable. Okay, well, that's a problem. You could say, well, couldn't we fix it by creating a new token on top of Hedera that has no privacy? That's all KYC. Everyone knows the owner of each account and you have to prove who the owner is, and there is absolutely no privacy. Wouldn't that help? Well, not really. An attacker would just never demand a ransom using your new token. So you could create a token that wouldn't be used for ransoms, but nobody would ever use that token. So it doesn't help. So no, d d uh, ledgers can't directly help with this. What we really need are formal methods, and then maybe also some improvements in authentication, which DIDs and other things, ledgers maybe play a role in. That's all. All right, yes an arms race on the security side. Mm -hmm. um, speaking of, Brett, before joining Hedera, you were with um, the FIDO Alliance. Is Hedera involved in any way with the FIDO Alliance? I wanna to touch on, on Lehman's last answer and, and tie into this a bit, because he mentioned authentication and you know what we can do about ransomware. I, I would just point people to, I won't go into this now, but our chain abuse um, announcement. Uh, so. The way you know, the National Security Council um, and the National Economic Council, the White House are, they seem to be sort of tag teaming and leading the effort around the executive order, which is this whole of government approach to figure out what to do and how to regulate 
uh, the DLT space. Um, and so I've, I've had some conversations and I've, I've learned a bit about the, Nat the National Security Council's perspective on this and ransomware is very much top of mind. Um, they're, they're publishing on it, they're, they're taking action on it. And, and one of the things they've done in many of their hearings, they've heard from folks um, you know, like the stakeholders behind the Chain Abuse Project to say you know, analytics. Analytics can do a lot more than you think, right? So yes, you can say it's untraceable at a first glance, but then these other uh, security firms and researchers are able to come in and that's how, that's where they've been able to collect a lot and prosecute quite a bit of this. So, you know, I just wanted to point out that Hedera is engaged with that community um, and supporting that. And you can read more about that on our blog, uh, announcing the, the chain of use partnership. Um, so back to just core authentication, uh, are we involved in, in FIDO Alliance? So, um, as you pointed out, I used to work at the Fight Alliance. I was the founding executive director and chairman of uh, the Fight Alliance uh, for a bit, a number of years in my career. Very proud and happy of the work that we've done there and very keen to see uh, some of their announcements uh, just the past month or so. Uh, Google announcing uh, Passkey, which is Fido technology um, in all of their uh, platform devices, Android, and Apple supporting, announcing support for Passkey, which is Fido in uh, all of their iOS and Mac uh, platforms. What I'd point out is um, FIDO is using public key cryptography for authentication. That was it, interoperable public key cryptography. We had public key cryptography, wasn't interoperable, and also some deployment and metadata things. So, um, but it's really a web 2.0 solution. So FIDO is really living in the web two space. And um, yes, I have a connection with the folks that are still running the FIDO Alliance. I've uh, been in touch with them recently, kind of exploring where they are. One of the things that happened back in 2015 is we spun up a blockchain study group to look at, was there a connection between FIDO and blockchain? And we've also uh, back then looked at, you know, decentralized identity and the connection there and making sure authentication used, you know, FIDO keys instead of maybe ledger keys. That work is still untackled, largely untackled, uh, is bringing those two worlds together. So right now I would say, the, the Fight Alliance is still very much focused on getting out these Web2 solutions and killing passwords in the Web2 space and the mobile application space. Um, but I think they're going to get their attention on Web3. And when they do, I would expect Tadera to be a significant uh, stakeholder in that collaboration. Thanks, Brett. Yes, still lots to do in, the, in securing Web2. Um, Scott, based on the achievements that Hedera has made so far, what one or two things do you think that Hedera is missing or needs to do before being truly recognized and perhaps dominant in the crypto space? Yeah, I, I want to take a slight um, tangent to the way to, to this question in, in some respects, because I think um, what is actually needed for that kind of uh, level of uh, adoption or recognition is the uh, the maturity of um, the development community actually in many respects so if i look at some of what we've uh, seen over the last particularly 12 to 18 months some of which has been a little frothy in the market um, uh, obviously um, we're not necessarily seeing applications um, that that actually need the type of technology attributes um, that, that, that Hedera offers. So I think it's not so much a question of what does Hedera you know, necessarily need to do or to build or to add a low car. Maybe I think Brett might have some observations on this after I'm done. Um, but actually for um, the, the, the sort of developer community, particularly the enterprise end, um, to start actually committing to, to building those mission critical high value things, which when you then decide, well, you know, back to my TVR point, when I do that, which protocol do I trust? Oh, it's the one that's got, you know, the best ABFT level consensus. Oh, it's the one that can scale so I don't find myself with a, a problem in terms of scalability and future-proofing my, my, you know, long-term mission critical application. Oh, it's the one that's got, you know, the trusted governing council running the, you know, the decentralization, you know, decentralized validator nodes. Um, you know, it's got, um, you know, the, the various technology features um, that, that do make Hedera unique. So in many respects, I think um, 
but it, it's there already. What is now needed is for the industry to come and start building some of those. And, and they are, you know, as, as I've alluded to in other questions, you know, we're seeing a lot of that sort of enterprise adoption now now starting to happen. These are not the quickest things to build or deploy or to scale, but when they when they do happen and when when, when people are making those technology choices, we are already seeing, you know, the, the attributes of Hedera being, being critical in those conversations. Yeah, what I would add is, um, in, in addition to that, what it really comes down is, is the validation of, of what, right? So, so we validated the technology, we validated uh, the governance model, we got to validate the business model, right? So we need large enterprises to, you know, who, to save money or make money with a solution in production that's using a public DLT. And what we still are seeing in the large enterprises, it's, a, it's just so familiar to, to cloud computing. And I used to go to these, you know, IT security stand, I worked in IT security standards my whole life. And I'd go to these meetings and people would just be mocking cloud. It's like, no, we will never, big iron will never move to the cloud. You know, there's only one way to do security right, you know, and that's on-prem. And now it's laughable when you look back at it. So there's gonna be those breakthrough enterprises that sit, that just go for it. Like some CIO is going to bet kind of their career on this, just like with cloud, and they're going to rally the troops and they're going to prove that they were right. And, and that's going to be the way it works for web three. I suspect, you know, I don't have a crystal ball, but I wouldn't be surprised if that happens. And so Hedera, you know, building this, this wonderful coalition of top enterprises filled with those type of people, people like Scott, people, people like Andy, who's on the call, um, uh, then we're really in the, that position to help them do that. And that's, that is kind of the way some of these conversations go, right? People are saying, all right, I'm trying to, you know, help me build the case, help me build my POC, help me build my business case. I'm the champion for bringing this technology into my big company. Big companies move slowly, but that's, that's what, that's the work we do. You know, that people don't necessarily see it on our website or at, at meetups, but that's a big part of the work we do is helping that internal champion uh, make that make that case inside their own company. Absolutely. Thanks, Brett. Um, Lehman, once full nodes resolve the order of transactions, how are those transactions stitched together? <laughs> I see. So there's two different things here. There's the consensus, the main net. And what it does is it puts the transactions in order and then every single node processes the transactions in the same order and updates the state. So if you send someone some H bars, it reduces your balance and increases their balance when it processes that transaction, or all the nodes decide that transaction is invalid, and when it processes it, nothing happens, one or the other. When we have done that, putting them in order like that, when the state is updated, we write the state to disk periodically, that's great, but we also want the mirror nodes to know what this consensus order was, and so we write the transactions with the records that say what happened to the disk. And so you have the transactions being processed. And after each one is processed, there's a record saying, did it succeed or did it fail? And what happened when it happened? If it was a smart contract, there's a lot of extra information. This all gets put into the record. And so then we have the record file. And the record file, we just start a new one every two seconds. And it says, over the last two seconds, tell me all the transactions that had reached consensus and were processed and all of the records for those. And that's what's in the record file. The record files are tied to each other with hashes, sort of like a blockchain, I suppose. And so, and they're digitally signed by the whole network. That <laughs> goes beyond what a blockchain would do. And so this then ends up going to the mirror nodes and they know it's true because of the signatures and then they know what has happened. So you could say that's sort of like a blockchain. And um, there's other things too that are sort of like blocks that are different from that. We also just have a group of transactions bound together in a group called an event, which is what we use for gossiping. We gossip in, in chunks of an event. That's a chunk of, of transactions that are being gossiped around. That's sort of like a block. And that event knows the hashes of its parents, of the last one created by the same person, the last one you received. Those hashes give Hashgraph its name. And then we also just... Um, um, have extra information, sidecar information that we're in the process of adding that will also get written to the disk. So there's lots of different things. All the different things we're writing all have chained by hashes. So they're like a hash, hash graph or like a, a blockchain in that way. And also are all signed by the network, 
which makes them stronger than a blockchain in that way. And so we do all those different things. Um, so that was a, a small question that kind of gave a big answer, but we've been doing this from the beginning and it has worked out great. It allows us to separate the work of consensus and handling the transactions from the work of being a mirror node that remembers everything for all, the, uh, all of history. Very useful separation. Great, thank you, Lehman, for that explanation. Um, Brett, on the last town hall, you talked about how the council members are going slowly to recruit new council members. Um, what's the plan for that recruitment effort and also to have those council members actually have use cases on the network? I may have to go back and watch that video, see if I actually use the word slowly. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, but yeah, uh, so, so exactly. What's going for was, you know, thoughtfully um, considered. Uh, so so I, I get it. I think that uh, especially the people that might be attending this town hall, um, we're kind of used to a lot of um, kind of uh, associating momentum of the project with increase of council members. And uh, you know, a lot of us kind of did, you know, we did, we associated that too you know, before. So this, this, this uh, time around, uh, when I get the same question, um, I'm going to try to try to unpack that, bring some, bring some transparency into how people are thinking about it now on the council. So first of all, just a quick fact uh, update. So the process of becoming a council member has changed. And now every new council member must basically be voted on twice. They have to be voted on by the membership committee, which is the nominating committee. And then they have to be finally approved by full vote of the council. Um, and so what's happened is that membership committee is really trying to um, take the time that it takes. I mean, not deliberately go slowly, but uh, to, to not rush getting their, their strategy together around who they want on the council. So I think it's more around who do we want to join us on this council? And sometime in the past, when we hit around maybe 21, 22, 23 council members, I would say that's when maybe the perspective of our members shifted a little bit away from conf conflating momentum of the project with momentum of the growth of the council. Uh, they really felt like they had adequate critical mass and it was more about, okay, you know, let's really focus on that new enterprise's use case. What is their use case? How are they gonna use the network? And that, that does add time. It's not a sales cycle per se, but it's more, we wanna make sure that you're gonna be a user of the network as best we can um, before putting you on the council. Um, so, and also looking for strategic connections because it won't be long, you know, if we kept the old pace up, you know, it wouldn't be long before the council be full. And now what are you gonna do? You can't add more council. I've been in that situation, you know, in, in previous organizations, they changed the bylaws so they could add more people because they got full. And then they changed the bylaws to add more people because they got full again. So I think what the membership committee is doing is, is, is wise, it's deliberate, and they're really trying to say, who do we want? And they're not rushing out to hit their quota. Thank you, Brett, for explaining that change. I think that's a really important one. Um, Scott, does it benefit Hedera adoption for HBAR prices to stay low? Do higher HBAR prices result in increased costs for startups and others building on the network? Uh, this is a relatively simple one because the, the cost of consumption of services in the network is denominated in, in USD, then it's, it's, it's really irrelevant, um, the price of the HBAR in terms of the cost of, of consuming those services. So no, it doesn't really um, help or hinder. I mean, I think to flip that question the other way, what, what is important is, uh, again, when people are looking at making a commitment to building a, uh, an application that's going to be using those Hedera services, that they have cost certainty um, and they don't have a situation as as we've seen with others during, um, you know, sort of rising markets where the cost of actually operating is going up substantially because of the, the appreciation of the, of the native crypto. So, um, you know, denominating in USD, which, you know, many people have their cost base in USD um, is obviously important. So, no, it doesn't really help or, or hinder. Absolutely. Okay. And Lehman, follow up question to that. With the um, current market cap of Hedera low um, with respect to the financial resources of uh, potentially malicious actors, um, if you think about, you know, big actors, how does the council ensure that a third stake of the coins is not already currently being accumulated by a bad actor? 
So a cool thing about proof of stake is that when an, an attacker needs to do a cost benefit analysis on an attack, the cost to them is in a very real sense going to be the price of the HBAR at the time they do the attack, not earlier. They might've accumulated earlier, but there's an opportunity cost. So there's a cost benefit analysis. The cost is how much did you pay to buy the coins, but also what is what are you giving up? Because when you do this attack, if you destroy the network, the coins now have zero value. You've lost whatever value you were holding in those coins. And so the cost to an attacker is in a very real sense, the value of the coins on the day they do the attack because they're giving up that value. The benefit to the attacker depends on, well, how valuable of a scam can you do by attacking the network, by forking it or by doing a double spend? Uh, you won't be able to get away with it for very long before the whole network coll collapses. So you'd better be able to squeeze a lot of billions of value out of it in that very, very short time. Uh, or it could be an indirect one. Maybe it's an, an attacker who is a world government that just hates all cryptocurrencies and wants to attack them all. So the good thing about a proof of stake system is that those two numbers tend to go up and down together. When the price is low, the attack costs less, but also has less value. When the price is high, the talk, attack costs more and has more value. And so the two kind of go together and it kind of scales itself. It becomes a self-improving system. Uh, as the network as a whole becomes more valuable, it becomes harder to do the attack and the attack is more valuable and they kind of balance out forever, uh, which is nice. I would also point out that there are world actors, world governments that could have been more aggressive against cryptocurrency than they have been. Um, so. I, the biggest example for me is that China could have done something really bad with Bitcoin by nationalizing the machines and reprogramming them, reprogramming them to extend the shorter of the two branches that are the longest, rather than the longest. That one little change would have not only crashed Bitcoin, it would have prevented anyone from fixing it without running something basically radically different. And they didn't do it. Instead, they just kicked out all the miners which I said at the time was absolutely the best thing possible for Bitcoin is to be kicked out because China really could have destroyed it and they weren't going down that path, which is interesting, I find. So who knows what other actors are doing? Um, but I think that uh, the question that started with, given the current price, isn't really relevant, which is a nice thing about proof of stake. It kind of is self-adjusting. And as the value goes up and down, the value of the, <laughs> the cost of the attack goes up and down, the value of the attack goes up and down with it. And so it's kind of self-scaling. Nice, nice aspect of proof of stake. All right, thanks, Lehman. Okay, Brett, I know we've talked a lot about regulators. Um, one more here, this, the US Senate um, recently outlined a proposed broad regulation um, for crypto under which most assets would qualify as commodities under um, the purview of the CFTC. Um, is Hedera confident that under the Senate outlines that uh, HBAR would not qualify as a regulated security? And was there anything included in those proposed regulations that was unexpected or might require a change in the current strategy or implementation? Sure, long question. Um, this one might be a shorter answer. Um, <laughs> so, so I think this question is, is, is citing the Lemus Gillibrand um, bill. And I would say that uh, what I said earlier, we're engaged. We're engaging in the process. And we were engaged in the Lumbus Gillibrand bill. Um, and we were very pleased with how open they were to our input. Um, and in general, how collaborative they are. We're members of other trade associations like the Blockchain Association, Digital Chamber of Commerce. So there are lots of ways to collaborate with legislators as they try to figure out the best way to do this. Um, so what I will say is that we are engaged and it's something that I see our council members getting more and more value out of and getting more and more involved in. We also responded to a recent um, uh, RFI from the Office of Science and Technology Policy around the climate impact of DLT. And in doing that, we were able to get um, a number of our you know, ESG experts on the council to participate um, in that work group and do that collaboratively. So this is kind of a new thing. Uh, this is, or at least it's a milestone in how involved the council members are in this kind of activity. Um, and we're gonna con continue to do more of this going forward. Uh, we think it's very important to engage in industry governance, not just our own network governance. 
Absolutely. Thanks, Brett. And I think that goes back to, you know, Scott's point about collaboration within, within the industry as well. Um, one more for you, Brett, or perhaps Scott as well. Um, does Hedera have the ability to grant or revoke HBAR transactions of individual account holders um, using a KYC key operation? Um, I think we might all end up needing to say something on this because Lehman's the right person to actually answer this question. But I'm curious about why they're even making that last reference in their question, um, the, the KYC key operation. Uh, but this is, uh, I, I guess there's a couple of questions that always come up on these town halls. This is one, because um, I'm sure, you know, if the answer could possibly be yes, it would be a concern. So the answer is simply no, no, the, the council cannot change a transaction. Um, there are a number of things the council can't do. I think Lehman has said them numerous, numerous times, but I guess uh, we're here to, to confirm that's right. You know, the council can't uh, uh, cancel or revoke a transaction regardless of the operations that they might be suggesting. Lehman, do you know why they're uh, mentioning a KYC key operation? Yes, I think that in the past there's been some confusion if you mint your own token, you are the one creating a new token type. You're allowed to set various things on it, including requirements for KYC, whatever you want to do. And it's transparent. If people don't like the way you've set it up, they don't have to use it. But you can set up some things like that. And people think, oh, no, I see a transaction with the name KYC in it. I think somehow Hedera is going to do this to me on my H bars. It's not the same thing. So um, please look at the thing that Zenobia put into the chat. It is not something to worry about. Hedera cannot freeze one of the accounts. Our code does not allow the council to do that. There is no signature the council can give that our current code would allow it to freeze an account or to pull H bars out of an account unless the, unless the um, council has the keys on that account. Unless you give us your keys, we cannot take your H bars. It just doesn't happen or your tokens. Um, and so I think people get confused when you create your own token type, you have lots of things that you can do with it and lots of powers you can give yourself. And then people can look at what powers you've given yourself and decide whether to use it. But for the rest of the system, there is no power that we are keeping. And that's intentional. I don't think it would be at all a good idea to do that. Yeah, yeah. Maybe I'll just jump in and, and give an example of the powers that we, we, we give ourselves, uh, for want of a better word, in, in, in TOCO. And, um, so we're obviously minting um, uh, tokens that have various you know, rights and attributes associated. But let me take a simple example. Um, if, if somebody did decide to you know, self-custody that token um, off, off chain or, or, or whatever, and they, they put it in a, uh, you know, a wallet or a cold storage of their own, and then they lost, they lost that physical device or the, or, the, or the private keys or whatever else, um, one of the things we've done in terms of you know, investor protection, uh, your token holder protection, uh, and indeed in, in discussing things with our insurers is provide a, uh, a sort of a, a burn and reissue functionality within, within, that, within that token. Now, to Lehman's point, if people don't like us to have that right, they, they won't use our, our system. But um, obviously, from an investor point of view, um, we, we then run that. We run that through, you know, a, a, a renewed kind of identification of the investor. We can go and track and say, well, you really are the right person. We can see you've just lost this. We can we can see you were the owner of it. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna uh, kill off that token, which is a, itself an interesting um, process, um, and, and and issue you a new one. So that's an example of where, uh, to Lehman's point, it's not happening at the Hedera level, but within within the the ecosystem that we're that we're building. Um, we felt that that was a, a useful protection for for investors, and the insurers agreed with it. So that's an example of that kind of uh, above above um, uh, Hedera kind of functionality that we've built within Togo. Scott, to your earlier point, I think we could spend an hour at least talking about all of the different functionality and the use cases um, that you all are building on TOCO. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I'm also going to ask you about another council member. Um, Avery Dennison made an announcement um, that they expect to be running billions of transactions on mainnet. Um, do you have an update on behalf of them that you could share? I, I do. Um, so uh, Pradeep, um, who I sit on the Hedera board with, uh, we know well, and I just had an update from Pradeep. He's one of the uh, uh, the key um, sort of stakeholders in the Atma um, uh, IO project. So it's a very very exciting project. Really really looking forward to uh, seeing it go um, you know go live and start to ramp up. Uh, the, the the answer to the question is the um, there is an expectation of of the transaction rate. 
uh, starting to increase over the course of, of July. I think that what the announcement was, I think around June, uh, again, enterprises are slow, checks, balances, um, slow to get going, but once they get going, they tend to have momentum. Um, so there's an expectation that's going to be ramping up over the course of, of, of July and, there, and thereafter. All right, thank you. And we are gonna wrap with one last question for Lehman. Um, Lehman, can you provide more details about implementation of the recently approved HIP 415, which is the introduction of blocks? And there are, um, there are a number of details that they're asking about, but I think you can probably articulate those certainly better than, um, than I. Okay, and I love the question. The question is, wait a second, this HIP says that you're going to make Hedera look like a blockchain by writing out all this extra information. Every transaction is going to be written out to a file along with a record that describes what happened. All that information is going to be hashed, and we're each, each of these blocks will contain the hash of the previous block. So it'll be chained hashes, and there'll be a bunch of signatures on each of these blocks. And then you'll be able to do queries to Hedera, and you'll say, tell me the millionth block on your blockchain. Well, we don't have a blockchain, but we'll tell you the millionth file, record file that was streamed out. And it goes all the way back to Genesis. Um, so, you know, for years and years now, uh, three or four years, we have it going back. And it will now look like a blockchain going all the way back to the beginning. And so the question was, now wait, how much is that going to slow you down? Can you still do 10,000 TPS if you have to do all this extra work? I love the question because we've been doing that work from day one. We've always been writing out these files and hashing them and including the hash of one in the next one and adding all these signatures on them. We've been doing that from the beginning. That's why the mirror nodes can be trusted or a mirror node can trust that it has the right data. And, uh, and so all we're doing with this HIP is exposing it to the world to make it look like it's a blockchain. Now, when you say, tell me the millionth block in your blockchain, we go to the millionth file, but the files have always been written out. Or if you say, tell me the hash of your millionth block, or tell me the timestamp on your millionth block, we just give you the hash or the timestamp of that file. It just gives you a new way to query what we already had and gives a new view of it, but it's powerful because it lets us interoperate with software that is hard coded to say, tell me the millionth block. I will not work unless you are a blockchain with a millionth block. Now we're a blockchain with a millionth block. Uh, and so it's purely on making this more interoperable and easier to use. It does not change any of the work that we're doing because we've been doing that work from day one. It will not slow us down at all. We do not have to test if it will slow us down. We've been doing it from the beginning. All right, Lehman. So fair to say, looks like a blockchain, walks like a blockchain, performs like a hash graph. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Wait, Zenobi, you must be from marketing. <laughs> I try. Um, well, everyone, I want to thank you for those in the US. If you are starting your long holiday weekend, um, please enjoy your time off. Um, for those who've dialed in from all over the world, we always appreciate you tuning in. Um, we look forward to these. We love giving you updates. Um, we hope to have a, um, a great variety, great cast of um, folks coming on um, so that you get some different perspectives. We hope that's helpful as we continue on this path to decentralization and so that you can um, see some of these things really coming to life. So Scott, Brett, Lehman, thank you so much and everyone out there be well. Oh, thank you. Have a good day. Bye-bye.